Well, uh, just a couple things before we get started today. Um, uh, welcome, if this is your first time, uh, if you haven't been here in a while. I know I got a couple messages that some folks said, hey, we're staying home today. Is this going to be online? So greetings to you who are watching online, because yes, we are online, but I'm just super glad that you guys are here. Uh, this is the hustle and bustle time. Like, this is this is it right here, right? Kids are off. I know that there are some schools that the kids have a couple more days or a handful of days. University students are here in town. Like this is just, this is it. Um, and so just to put on your calendar, one more thing. Um, next Sunday is uh, Christmas Eve. We will be in this building in the morning. Uh, Frank Sunday School class will still meet. There will be no youth. Um, the front Sunday, Sunday School class will not formally me, but some of you want to be here, and so good coffee will be made, maybe we'll have hot cocoa next Sunday, and so just come and hang out if you want uh, on uh, Sunday morning, and then Sunday evening on the 24th, um, we will have our Christmas Eve candlelight at 6 p.m., so back in this room at 6 p.m. if you're here, I always make a promise to you on Christmas Eve that I will not keep you longer than 45 minutes. Um, and so if you're in between going to a house or two, or you've still, like we talked about before, you still got some shopping to do, Walgreens doesn't close till 7. Um, and so I'll get you out enough time to get to Walgreens on Dassey and Broadway to buy that gift card for your wife. Um, so, so be sure to be here. Um, uh, that's what's happening uh, this week. Hey, so let me say this as our kids just took off. Um, Man, um, for those of you that are parents in this room, myself included, hear, I hear these words with um, like grace and favor and humility. You are the most influential person in your child's life. Whether you know it or not, whether you want to believe it or not. Um, but what just happened, and even the preparations that were being made to happen here, I was at uh, uh, Janice Amaro, uh, who kind of helped thrust this into motion, said, I hope your expectations are not too high. And I said, my expectations are really high. Um, and the fact that these kids spoke gospel message today. Um, and I remember when I was their age. And uh, I might not have fully grasped the weight of the gospel message, but I knew that what I was doing mattered um, because my parents were super proud of what I was doing. And those other influential adults in my life were super proud of what I was doing. And so you are the most influential person in your kid's life. Now, I will say this. You're going to make mistakes. We are going to make mistakes. My two daughters are in this room, and I think they're listening, and I will make mistakes. Um, and as kids, even the one yelling at me right now, they will make mistakes. They too will make mistakes. But the beauty is that the grace of God transcends over those mistakes. And what we do in gathering, especially during the season, matters. And so I think this is a huge day for us in realizing what has taken place and what will continue to take place really does matter. And that you are the most influential person in your kid's life. And so uh, don't take that for granted. Would we not take that for granted? Also, as we transition to the pink candle, which is the joy candle, um, uh, if you've been tracking with us during this Advent season, uh, week one, two weeks ago, was the hope candle that, that, that we lit. Um, and, and we made this statement, like our, our Sunday service was, was anchored around this statement. Um, who or what or where we place our hope matters. And if the truth is, let's make it very clear. If it's anything but our Lord and Savior Jesus, how's that working out for us? Because anything and everything aside from Jesus is going to fail us at some point or another. And so where, what, and who we place our hope in matters. Uh, uh, last week we, we lit and talked about peace. We lit the peace candle. 
And I've left it up. It's just been such a beautiful reminder for me. Um, peace is in the neighborhood, right? Uh, we saw in John's account that, that at just the right time, um, God dwelt among us. The message, paraphrase version says, um, God sent his son Jesus to, to move into the neighborhood. Peace has come into the neighborhood. We need peace like never before. And the truth is, I kind of laugh when we say that because probably the generation before this said, we need peace like never before. And then the generation that's coming, uh, uh, like in the future, will say, we need peace like never before. Because when, when Jesus is not here amongst us, it is chaos. And so we need peace. And so peace is in the name of it. And then there's joy. Uh, there's such thing as the Christmas blues. Do you know that? Like not just the, oh, I won't like, sing the whole thing. But there's the Christmas blues, and, and um, I don't know if you like follow podcasts or listen to the news or how, what like is in being taken in throughout the week, but like this week, Everything that I was listening to or watching or, or reading, tracking with, had this um, overarching theme that the Christmas blues are here. And it was defined really in kind of three avenues. The first was the weather. Last week was a grayer than normal week in San Antonio. Like, today is a typical December day in San Antonio. Yesterday, too. It's going to be 70. Like, this sweater, my, my armpits are sweating standing here, but I want to look like Christmas time, right? And I'm sweating in here, so don't come near me at the end of service, because I stink. <laughs> Normal day outside is like this, like it's just beautiful, um, but there are places all, like if you're from anywhere other than Texas, especially if you're from the north, like it's just gray, and it's dreary, and it's wet, and it's just a mess. Um, and this week we kind of felt that, right? Like it was a bit more overcast than normal. And so because of that, when there's a lack of that sun igniting the vitamin D inside of us, we, we feel it and we wear it, don't we? Um, as a matter of fact, on Wednesday, um, men, we get together every Wednesday morning up in the front room, 6 a.m., uh, Leighton and I are here, and, and this last Wednesday as we got in here, uh, uh, I had to leave a little early, so I texted Leighton, hey, how did the rest of men's go? And he said, man, I don't know what's going on. Everybody was really quiet. I think it's the weather, is exactly what Leighton told me. So we, we feel this, right? Or at least we try to acknowledge that maybe the reason why we feel the blueness that we're feeling is because of the weather. Uh, the second thing that we're feeling that makes Christmas times a bit blue is that we just had Thanksgiving and those people were in our house that we're going to have to see in just a short time again. <laughs> Now, those of you that didn't laugh, it's because you are that person for your family. <laughs> those of you that laugh know that that's you, right? Like, now you're laughing because you're like, ah, oh, yeah, awkward. <laughs> like these family dynamics that we have, right? There's, there's brokenness, hurt, things were said, things were felt, the past is brought back up. The future is brought back up, right? Uh, politics, 2024 is an election year. I'll tell you this, there's a Bible verse that, uh, from Jeremiah 29 that I want to be our overarching theme for 2024. I'm getting ahead of myself. But the reason why I sent this to Leighton, this was the week of Thanksgiving. I sent Jeremiah 29 to Leighton. I said, hey, let's pray about this because I, I think I want this to be our theme verse because it says... Um, be mindful of the welfare of your city. Because when it prospers, you prosper. Because I already know next November is going to be terrible. Po politically. And so would we pray now for the welfare of our city? Pray now for the welfare of our country? Because when it prospers, we prosper. Knowing that this is not our home. We're exiles here. This is not our home. Heaven bound is our home. And so we know, number two, that, that those kind of dynamics placed into a family setting, they're coming to your door or you're going to their door very soon. 
That's kind of the second thing that brings the holiday blues, the Christmas blues. And then the third and final thing, um, I just don't have the resources for the kind of gifts that I want to give my family. I, my, the resources that I'm living in right now, it's just not enough. Right? Like we feel these aches, right? And even if our resources are better than they were last year, it just doesn't seem like it's enough. And, and, and so it's, it's, a, it's a, a mix of weather and politics and government and, and current affairs and family dynamics and, and, and just a total just loss and overwhelmingness that brings these blues. And so we light the pink candle for joy today and say Merry Christmas to one another in the middle of that. I also find it interesting that during the Christmas blues, during this Advent season, during the, the mix of purple candles, which is the color of Advent, there's a pink one, which is different. So, almost in the middle of the Advent season, stand out from the rest to remind us that there is something different about this season that we need so boldly as a reminder that joy doesn't come from the circumstances around us. Friends, joy doesn't come from even a, a, a feeling that we decide to feel. Joy comes from our Heavenly Father who sent Jesus. And the kids just read that, right? Like we just read Luke 2. If you have a Bible, that's where we're going to be. If you have your, your mobile device, we're going to be in Luke chapter 2. We're going to be in a couple other places too. Um, but, but Luke chapter 2 is like this familiar place that gives this birth narrative. It, it, it gives this, this narrative of, 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 of Mary and Joseph um, traveling. And, and, and they get to Bethlehem. And it, there's no room in the inn, and so here's where I want you uh, to give birth. And, and then the, the Christ child is born, and, and then there are shepherds, right? And then there are wise men that eventually show up. But before we get to that narrative, before we get to reading that, I don't think we do the narrative justice by skipping Luke chapter 1. And really, by skipping the first four verses of Luke chapter 1. And, and so that's what I want to do before we go any further, is I want us to open our Bibles to Luke chapter 1 and read the first four for, first. I'm already getting so excited here. And I had too much coffee. And I'm sweating. I'm just a hot mess, right? Luke chapter 4, Luke chapter 1 in the first four verses. If it's not circled or squared or highlighted or underlined, it should be. After today, and it's going to be up on the screen. Luke chapter 1, verses 1 through 4 says this. Many, many have undertaken to draw up an account of the things that have been fulfilled among us. Many have undertaken. So, so this, this guy named Luke who's a physician, who's an investigator, who's a highly intelligent, educated individual, his first statement to us is, many have presented this narrative, this gospel story. As a matter of fact, um, we already know of, and he probably already knew of Matthew's account, and Mark's account, and John's account, and there were other accounts, other maybe um, um, stories given like audibly or orally as, as tradition. Or maybe there were other writings that were passed around giving account. There were, there were as he, Luke, is going to notice that there were other eyewitnesses, right? So Jesus was a real individual who was really born in the first century. And then, and then grew to be a 30-something-year-old man who, who, who then walked really walked on the earth doing ministry, um, touching lives physically, healing and, and, and setting free of, of, of ailments and, and teaching in such a way that was so profound. But, but there were eyewitnesses to that. And, and Luke says many have given account, given testimony to this. And then he says this in verse 2. 
just as they were handed down to us by those who were from the by I'm sorry, by those who were from the first were eyewitnesses and servants of the word. Now, in verse 2, I want us to notice, just as they were handed down to us. Now, it's, it's, we must know that Luke, who's writing the Gospel of Luke and the book of Acts, is someone whose life was changed by Jesus also. Us, meaning, Luke, Luke wasn't a Jewish individual. Luke is what is known as a Gentile, uh, didn't have the upbringing in the Jewish faith and the Jewish tradition, and yet as a, a non-Jew, because of the message of Jesus, gave his life to follow Jesus, and so he's putting himself in this same camp, that this message, this testimony, this eyewitness account has been given to us, and I'm one of those. And then uh, verse 3, he says this. With this in mind, since I myself, man, watch this, have carefully investigated everything from the beginning, I myself have carefully investigated everything. I'll, I'll, let me keep reading this. Everything from the beginning, I too decided to write an orderly account for you, most excellent Theophilus, so that you may know the certainty of the things that you have been taught. Luke has decided to carefully investigate everything from the beginning. He's not talking about from the beginning that is like Genesis to Malachi. No, he's not going, I'm, I'm, I'm not carefully investigating uh, uh, that. Now, all throughout Luke's gospel, we see this, um, um, these hyperlinks to Old Testament text. But he carefully investigates everything from the beginning, meaning Christ's birth. So he carefully investigates while in Bethlehem carefully investigates by speaking to Mary. We find out later that Jesus has other brothers and sisters, and so he sits down with them. It's probably believed at this time that Joseph is, is dead. He's no longer, so I don't, I don't know if he got to spend any time with Joseph at all, but he carefully investigated maybe neighbors, maybe those that went into the carpenter shop of Joseph and Jesus. Uh, the the, the Disciples that were to become apostles carefully investigated and then gave an orderly account with order chronologically. That, that's why we see when we read Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John together, the, the, what we call the harmony of the Gospels, when we put it all together, there are some stories that kind of seem out of place. There, there are some... Uh, a timeline of events that kind of see, well, why did John put it there? Why did Matthew, Mark, and Luke put it there? And, and, and it's almost as if Luke orderly, in an orderly way, put his account together. And now here is what I really want us to hear to, to walk away with. Why? Why did he do this? Now, before I get to Luke's why, I want to remind us of John's why. So, so remember, we spent recently as a church, and, it, and if you weren't here, we recently spent a significant amount of time going through the 21 chapters from the gospel account according to John. And, and John says it often, especially uh, in, in, at the end, in chapter 20 and chapter 21. He says, um, there is so much more that I have to say, that I can write down so much more that the, all the books in the world could not contain what has happened because of Jesus. But what is here, I give you so that in him you might believe. Like John tells you his why. I am writing down these things from John chapter 1 to John chapter 22, John chapter 21. 
This is here, friends, when you read this, so that you will believe and have faith in the Messiah, the Savior, Jesus Christ. Look what Luke says in chapter 4. Chapter 1, verse 1. So that you may know the certainty of the things that you have been taught. I don't know if you're struggling with this faith. I don't know if you're struggling with this, this um, Bible that is before us today. And I would say that it's okay to question. It's okay to want to dive in all the more because there's wondering and, and, and doubt and thoughts. But truly, is this real? In, 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 in the middle of what seems like so much chaos that, that lighting a pink candle, Bobby, on a Sunday is not going to be enough to bring joy into this world. In, in the light of that context of a world that we're living in, Luke, in, in black letters in my Bible, and then it's highlighted in, in, in bright yellow for me to see. This is here so that there is certainty about what we have been taught. I've, like I've been in church myself personally since I was in the fourth grade. I've been taught a lot. Some of which I don't even remember. Not because of the person teaching, but because I wasn't even paying attention. And maybe other times because it was a bad teacher's. But Luke wants us to know today, before we go any further, What's in here and what you're about to read, what has been read during this Advent season, has been given to us, carefully investigated, put in an orderly account, so that we would know and have certainty that it's true, that we can believe and rest in and lean on what we call the gospel. The good news that at just the right time God loved this whole world that He sent us up to be in the neighborhood, to be hope, to be peace, and to be joy. And so, I want us to know for certain three things today, and I want us to see it in Luke's gospel. So, turn with me to chapter 2. Chapter 2, starting in verse 8 of Luke. Luke chapter 2, verse 8. The first thing that I want us to see here, first certainty, what I want us to know for certain is that there is on this planet joy and joy for all. And it's in the account, starting in, in, in Luke chapter 2, verse 8. And there were shepherds living in the fields nearby. Now, I'm not going to spend too much time here, but um, this is extremely significant. Because although we made it look really cute up here with the kids dressed up as shepherds, and although our nativity, our nativity scenes seem so perfectly up on our mantle or on our table, or whatever it might be, um, shepherds were hideous. Shepherds spent so much time out in the fields with sheep, that they stunk. Shepherds were notoriously known as um, thieves and robbers. Shepherds, as it was written in the law in this time, could not, um, um, and maybe this is a good thing, they could not serve ju jury duty. Like they couldn't go into court to, to be known as um, um, witnesses because um, nobody wanted to hear what they had to say because they were notoriously thieves and robbers. Didn't have a good reputation. It wasn't a good thing to be a shepherd. Yet, Luke tells us, because he spent his time investigating, maybe he spent time with those shepherds. There were shepherds living out in their fields nearby, keeping watch over their flocks. Verse 9 of Luke 2, an angel of the Lord appeared to them, and the glory of the Lord shone around them. 
And they were terrified. Who was terrified? The shepherds were terrified. But the angel said to them, Don't be afraid. I bring you good news that will cause great what? I don't know what you think about. I don't know what we think about when we think of this moment of angels showing up. I don't know if you think of like a baby with wings and the harp showing up. Um, I think we're wrong if that's what we think of. I think of uh, maybe our thoughts are this like beautiful, long, flowing, blonde hair, blue eyed, strong looking man with wind blowing and the hair is like behind of an angel. I think that's wrong too. The reason why I think that those are both wrong is because every time an angel shows up, people are scared. So I think these were scary looking creatures. Because the first words out of their mouth every time is don't be afraid. Don't be afraid. And I wonder if today we too need to hear that. Don't be afraid. Angel said to them, don't be afraid, I bring you good news that will cause great joy for all people. I said this last week, and I hope I, 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 I put like extreme em emphasis on it. Um, the hope that we talked about two weeks ago, the peace that we talked about last week, and the joy that we're leaning into today is not just for people who attend church on Sunday mornings, especially during Advent. Now I'm glad you're here, but the peace and the joy and the hope is not just for us. I love the fact that on Christmas Eve candlelight service, there are people that I'm like, how come I only see you once, once a year? Like, I'm glad you're here. Let me give you a hug. I'll see you next Christmas, right? Some reason we think it's only when we enter into this place that God's favor and grace is lavished on us. No, no, this is great joy for all people, regardless of what context you're in, or whether you show up on Sundays or not. Today in the town of David, a Savior has been born to you. He is the Messiah, which means Savior. Do we realize we need Savior? Some of you nodded yes, and some of you didn't nod. I wonder if that's because you didn't really think I should nod, or you just don't realize you need to be saved. Like, we need to be set free. Um, um, the author uh, of the majority of the New Testament, Paul, uh, like, over and over and over again, reminds us, um, um, before Christ, you lived this way. Before Christ, you looked like this. But now, with Christ, you're restored. Like, you, you have newness of life in Christ. Um, the author of Hebrews says that, that um, we are so entangled in our sin. We need to be saved, set free, forgiven, healed, redeemed, restored, picked out of the mire and the muck that life we find ourselves in this broken life. The joy comes because the Savior has been born. In verse 12 of chapter 2, uh, this will be a sign to you. You will find a baby wrapped in cloths and lying in a manger. Then verse 13, suddenly a great company of heavenly hosts appeared with that angel, praising God and saying, glory to God in the highest heaven and on earth peace to those whom his favor rests. Now, again, I don't, I don't know if we do that justice enough. Like, we read it, and it's great that we read it, but um, the, like, the literal interpretation of what's happening here in Luke chapter 2, verses 10 through 12, like, the literal interpretation is this, mega joy. Like, those three verses can be summed up in those two words, mega joy. To all people. Like maybe that's how we should greet one another. Like before you leave, find someone, grab them in the shoulders and say, 
mega joy and shake them a little bit if you want. Like all week this week, leading up to Christmas Eve. Like remember the Advent season that we're in, the four Sundays leading up to Christmas Eve and Christmas Day? It, it's this, this anticipation, like this brewing or stirring inside of us that the, the, the birth of the Savior is born. That should bring mega joy, not holiday blues. Like, we should walk differently. If you believe in Jesus as your Lord and Savior, we should walk differently because of the mega joy that's found in that baby. And many of us need to hear that because we're walking around so blue and broken and hurting. And if, it's that, if that's where we're at today... Leave it here and walk out of here with mega joy. Because it's for all people. And it's for us today. And Luke tells us you can know this for certain. Like I'm writing mega joy for you. I even wrote in my Bible in big letters twice with stars. Mega joy. Luke is saying I'm giving this to you as certainty. It's truth. And you can believe in it. It's the first thing I want us to see. The second thing comes out of chapter 3. And Luke wants us to know for certain that the Son of God came to take sin away. Just in case we missed it, let's turn to chapter 3. Luke chapter 3, starting in verse 21. Now, there's, as you're turning there, there's this other narrative, and we don't have enough time, and I don't even know what time it is, because I put my clock down right here, and somebody put a sweater on it, and so I don't even know what time it is right now. So, you're just hanging with me the rest of the day. There's this narrative that uh, Luke also tells us about, this, this other baby that was born. This other baby was who? John the Baptist, or John the Baptizer. He wasn't John the first to Baptist. He was John the Baptizer because he was baptizing people. He, he was preparing a way. Remember John's account, uh, or John's story is that, that he was the one to come before, to, to make ready, to make way for the one then to come. Luke chapter 3, starting in verse 21. As John was baptizing... And when all the people were being baptized, Jesus was baptized too. That's why we as a tradition of this Baptist church baptize people because Jesus was baptized. He was, he was fully immersed into the Jordan River and, and fully raised, which, which later would be a testimony of Jesus fully dying and put into the grave, and, and Jesus then fully resurrecting and coming back to life. When all the people were being baptized, Jesus was baptized too, and as he was praying, heaven was opened. Luke tells us in chapter 3, verse 22, And the Holy Spirit descended on Jesus in bodily form like a dove, and a voice came from heaven. And uh, James Earl Jones spoke, You are my son, whom I love, I'm well pleased. Right? No, somebody, only two of you got it. A voice came from heaven, you are my son, whom I love, and I am well pleased. Now Jesus himself was about 30 years old when he began his ministry. He was the son, as it was thought, Joseph. But in this moment, what was it? In this moment, as Jesus comes up out of the water, as he's praying, there for all to see this, this dove descending down as the Holy Spirit and a voice, Father God's voice saying, this is my son. And it's in that moment that Luke wants us to see for certainty that God sent his son to the world to be hope, peace, and joy. And just a little insight to next week. You still have to show up, even though I'm giving you the answer to next week. 
love. This is God's Son to be hope, peace, joy, and love for the world. And for certainty, He's on display for all to see. The third thing that I want us to see and know for certainty is that we must know where it is that we belong. We must know where it is that we belong. We see that when Luke writes in Luke chapter 10. So turn with me if you've got your Bible, if you've got your mobile device open. One last place that I want us to see, and it's from Luke chapter 10. Jesus just gives a very intense account that, that there's a cost to following me. You must lay down your life to follow me. You must give everything to follow me. Jesus sends out his, his disciples to do and continue the work that he's already been doing. And up until this point that, that we're going to read out of Luke chapter 10, Jesus has already said a number of times, there's going to be a moment that I'm not going to be here much longer. They don't quite get it in this moment. And then um, it's almost as if there's a hustle and bustle about this story that we're about to read here. Just like the hustle and bustle that we find ourselves in today and this week leading up to Christmas Eve and Christmas and the New Year. And in Luke chapter 10, with certainty, Luke reminds us that when the hustle and bustle is gone, there is a place for us to be. There is a posture for us to take. And it's found here in Luke chapter 10, with certainty, starting in verse 38. Luke chapter 10, verse 38. As Jesus and his disciples were on their way, they came to a village where a women, woman named Martha opened her home to him. Now, do you remember what town that is? It starts with a B, ends with an ethany. Bethany, good. This is Bethany. And Jesus goes to three individuals' home that he really loves, Mary, Martha, and Lazarus. Verse 39 of Luke 10 says, with certainty, she had a sister called Mary, who sat at the Lord's feet listening to what he said. But Martha was distracted by all the preparations that had to be made. She came to Jesus and asked, Lord, don't you care that my sister has left me to do all the work by myself? Tell her to help me! Exclamation point. Now, before I go any further, what I am not wanting us to see here is that don't make the preparations. Don't be busy. Don't do the tasks. No, you're not off that easy. There are still things to be done as we are called to do. Do those things. Get done this week what you need to get done. Adhere to the things that are in front of you and the people that are in front of you. But notice, again, with certainty, what happens next. Lord, don't you care that my sister has left me to do the work by myself? Tell her to help me. Verse 41, Martha, Martha. Just a side note. Anytime there are words repeated one after another in any of the gospel accounts or the Bible for that matter, it's because it's important we must pay attention. Martha, Martha. My mom's name is Martha and I hope she's watching because this is for her. Hi, Mom. Martha, Martha, the Lord answered. You are worried and upset about many things. Maybe that's us today. Worried and upset about many things. Jesus says in verse 42, but few things are needed. 
or indeed only one. Mary has chosen what is better, and it will not be taken away from her. With certainty, Luke writes the reminder, it says, in the midst of the hustle and bustle, in the midst of the many things that need to get done, Jesus doesn't dismiss those things. Jesus doesn't say, don't ever care about those things. No, what Jesus does is says, I, I want you to reorient that in the middle of those things, and once those things are done, there's one place that you must find yourself. And it's where Mary is, and it will not be taken from her. Where is Mary? She's at the feet of Jesus. She found herself, she placed herself in front of Jesus. And it's there, nobody or nothing will take that away from her. Remember what Paul writes? Like, I, I can't help but think of Romans 8 when Paul writes that there is Nothing, there is no height, no depth, no, no, no anything in this world, no angel, no demon. Nothing can separate us from the love of God that is found in Christ Jesus our Lord. That's what Jesus is pointing to in this moment. And Luke is writing with certainty. Remember, he carefully investigated. Maybe he spent time with Mary. Maybe he spent time with Martha. Maybe he spent time with Lazarus because he's back to life again. And with certainty said, there is a spot for us to be. And it's in front of Jesus. And nothing or no one will ever remove you from that spot. And so friends, today's a different day. It's the joy day. It's the joy that day that then springboards, or the hope that it springboards us for this week. Because I know, without a doubt, the moment we leave those doors, there is so much that has to be done. And so do it. But be reminded with certainty that there is one place that we will go and must go that won't be hindered or taken away from us. The joy, the place that is found, the joy with our Savior, Jesus Christ. And so would we lean into that certainty? Would we rest in mega joy for all? Rest in a joy that is found in God sending His Son to take away our sins. And us resting in that place even in the hustle and bustle. Would you pray with me, Father God? Thank you that we got to be in this place together. Thank you for our children. Thank you for the kids that came up here and reminded us of the, the overwhelming uh, trust and joy, unashamed joy that's found in being childlike and would we be childlike again? What do we also realize? God, that there is mega joy because you sent your son, Jesus. And this season exemplifies that. And so forgive us of our sin. Heal us. Mend us. Would we live in the life that is found in the resurrected Jesus Christ? And would we continually, even in the hustle and bustle, even in the Christmas blues, would we place ourselves, would we posture ourselves at your feet, Jesus, knowing that there is nothing that can take us away from you? Hope is in you. Peace is in you. And mega joy is in you, Jesus. And it's in your name we pray. Amen. Have a super week. Uh, see you soon. Uh, hopefully we'll see you next Sunday. Bye.